times uh, this, this talk uh, due to COVID the first time and then some follow-up COVID I, I had. So this is the <laughs> third time we finally were able to do it. So um, I said, uh, as it was said just a second ago, my lab, my lab really focuses on developing bioinspired sensors. And the mantis shrimp has been a big inspiration for a lot of the research that's going on in my lab. So the first probably 15 minutes, I actually talk a little bit more on the biology side and then we'll get into some of the engineering uh, concepts. So uh, I urge you to, by the way, after my talk to go on YouTube and just Google, there are really cool videos of mantis shrimp, uh, you know, people that do research on mantis shrimp. They're really cool stuff, you know, from their visual system, navigation, to, uh, they're extremely colorful, right? They're considered one of the best predators in the shallow waters. Uh, they are relatively vicious. Actually, when we do some of this research, you have to be careful. They can really take a, uh, you know, produce a big cut on your, on your hand if you're not, uh, not careful. They're extremely beautiful, but also uh, they're big, one of the best predators in shallow waters. And really goes back to the idea of how, how do they achieve this? And their visual system is one of the uh, clues here, and, and it's really one of the most complicated, arguably, visual system and most complete visual, uh, visual system out there uh, in nature. So I'm just going to focus the first really 15 minutes on the biology side. And if you're not familiar about the mantis shrimp visual system, this is kind of an, an overview. Uh, they're able to sense they have multispectral imaging capabilities, including linear polarization and circular polarization vision. So the way they achieve this, right, they, depending on the species, they can sense anywhere from 12 to 16 different spectral bands, spanning the UV, visible, and a little bit in the near infrared spectrum. So, you know, uh, marine biologists and uh, neuroscientists have done a lot of behavioral experiments as well as putting little uh, probes uh, in their eyes and seeing, you know, if they provide certain stimulus, is there neural activity? So you take a narrow band light, for example, or some uh, UV LEDs, you shine and you see if there is uh, any neural activity, right? So they actually mapped out different parts of their eyes, how they're able to send uh, visual information. Um, and what's really interesting here, this is a cross-sectional profile just in this mid-band. This is where their highly spectral imaging capability comes in. They have a little micro lenses uh, on top that they focus light in their omatidiums, the, the little photoreceptors. Right underneath their uh, micro lenses, they're actually spectral filters. They sort of shape up the spectrum that they want to see. And then they actually have typically two to three vertically stacked photodetectors or uh, photosensitive elements within single single column. And each one of these columns uh, is sensitive to different, different wavelengths. So it's interesting, you know, as light comes in here, the top photodetectors are mostly sensitive to UV light or lower wavelengths. Uh, and typically, this is the reason because UV light does not penetrate much deeper into their eyes. So if I'm trying to sense uh, UV light, even if you're building photodetectors, they have to be relatively shallow versus longer wavelengths tend to penetrate deeper. So they actually put their photodetectors even deeper in their eyes. So it's a very spatially uh, efficient way of detecting color information, right? Just It's not just the one photodetector with some filters on top. They are using that plus the fact that light at different wavelengths will penetrate at different depths in their eyes. It happens also with different materials in semiconductor materials that we'll see uh, later. Also in their, the way they're sensing their, their light is photosensitive uh, pigments or microbilli. In some of the photoreceptors, they are sort of randomly organized. There's no particular structure. But there are some of those photoreceptors, they are nicely packed. So their microbilli tend to be about 50 to 70 nanometers and they're slowly, and they're packed together. So here, this, this is an SEM image. This microvilli are coming, in this row, they're coming out of this plane. In this, in this plane, they're parallel to each other. So they have little polarization sensing capabilities, right? If you have sort of structure on the order of 50 to 70 nanometers that are photosensitive, they can be also sensitive to preferable linear polarization properties. And also they have uh, quarter wave retarders inside their eyes. So really, when you think about it, they also have left and right quarter wave retarders. And they're actually achromatic. They have quarter wave for uh, roughly, uh, I think, 400 to 600 nanometers. 
So it's kind of remarkable. And by the way, when I say linear polarization, they actually have four different linear polarization orientations. Uh, so you got four linear polarization filters, two quarter wave retarders, and 16 different spectral bands, right? So it's a lot of spectral information they're able to gather. Uh, in a relatively you know, small camera, if you like to think about it, about a millimeter in, in diameter. Now, they do scan, right? It's a bit of a push broom you know, uh, mechanism here. They're not getting immediately to the information, but they are getting able to aggregate this information they're scanning. Their eyes are also, the two materials are uh, independent of each other, so easily they can fix it on their target. They sort of scan it a little bit while they're sort of keeping an eye what's going on with the other eye. Right, so when there's something interesting the other eye captures, they can jump in uh, and then uh, slow it. It was an interesting behavioral experiment. It was done, if you shine, let's say 10 degrees polarized light and you have 0, 40, up to 90, what the animal does is tries actually to get the maximum response. So it would rotate with the closest polarization filter to get a maximum response. Right, so whichever filter is closest, if it's the 0 degree filter, it gets rotated 10 degrees, right? If it's the 45 degrees, it might rotate it. So there's a lot of interesting stuff, how much optimization, right? If you're trying to get the best signal to noise ratio, you know, you need to be matching some of the signatures to what you're, what you're sensing too. Now, briefly, I just wanna talk about polarization of light here, right? Yes? Quick question, uh, is there a measurement of how broad the field of view is to their eyes? Um, there, uh, there is. I don't know off the top of my head, right? But just to kind of uh, make a point here, uh, the middle band here is where most of the spectral, uh, spectral sensitivity is happening. And the quarter wave retarders are also in, in actually in the, uh, the last row here. Mm -hmm. Linear polarization filters 0, 45, 90, 135 are actually in the periphery. Right. So yeah, um, in the center part, they have much better field of view much uh, better resolution too. So, good, uh, good point. Um, I'll talk a, more on the polarization properties of light, but I do want you just to keep in mind this concept of vertical mistake detection that you see in the metric screen part. Now, I'll talk about polarization of light. I just figure it's good to introduce some concepts about polarization of light. <coughs> we know light is an electromagnetic wave. It got three properties, which is the intensity, Think of this wave, what is the amplitude of this wave? That gives us the intensity that we can perceive. The frequency of this wave gives us the color, but also how is this wave oscillating? How is it propagating in time and space? Defines polarization properties of light, right? So if I think of it as a light, as a rope, as I'm wiggling it up and down, this is, for example, would be 90 degree linearly polarized light. If I'm rotating, if I'm wiggling this rope uh, in this plane, that would be horizontally polarized light, if I sort of give the circle motion, that would be circularly polarized light as it propagates toward, toward you, right? Now, if I want to filter it, think of your polarization sunglasses essentially as a fence, right? And actually, your polarization sunglasses typically have some molecules that are uh, typically 50 to 80 nanometers. that are nicely spaced, nicely packed, um, and they actually act as this fence so they can block some of these uh, vibrations. Right, so what we do actually when we put polarization sunglasses, essentially we throw away information. Right, the mantis shrimp actually has a set of filters that is going to detect zero degree, another one 90 degree. They're not throwing away any information. The same thing with the spectral information, I would argue. So how does light become uh, polarized, right? So light will always becomes polarized when it interacts with an object, right? So the most common thing that we see it and you experience it uh, is when light gets reflected from a surface. So whenever light is emitted from the sun, typically it's unpolarized, it's, or it could be very weakly polarized, but we think of it as this randomly photons that are propagating towards you, and the moment it hits a surface, so you have the water, road, the majority of oscillations is going to be parallel to the surface. So you put these polarization sunglasses, you actually particularly block that horizontally polarized light. Now, if you put your polarization sunglasses and you look at windows, right, that is going to be vertically polarized light. So you have to tilt your head and you see some dimming and some weird, weird artifact. Now, the amount of polarization, this is the degree of polarization, depends on the angle. 
but the major axis of, of, of oscillation will be typically parallel to the, to the surface, un unless there's just scatters in all possible directions. So typically, right, uh, this allows you to see what's under the water. So there's a little sign um, underwater. You can't see it because you're getting these specular reflections that are horizontally polarized. You can actually remove those uh, by putting polarization filters. If you put your polarization sunglasses and you look at the sky, the sky is polarized as well. Why is that? Because of scattering. You can have different types of scattering, Riley, Mia scattering, right? That depends on your size of the particle, right? And that's going to de determine what these polarization properties, right? We have different types of particles in our atmosphere. So you have unpolarized light from the, uh, from the sun in the 90 degree uh, uh, viewing angle. So you kind of have to do the geometry of your head you're going to have vertically polarized light, the maximum polarization properties of light. If you look at some other parts of the sky where this angle between your light source and the scattering is different, you're going to have different angles, so uh, light might not be polarized at all. It's actually, there's a lot of evidence that animals use this polarization information on the sky for as a compass mm -hmm. or as a navigational tool. We're trying to take it one step further is there a GPS position, right? So this is sort of the other argument I'm going to make is, you know, you have compass that just tells me north, south, where I'm heading. GPS is going to give me longitude and latitude information, which is a bit different what we're doing. This is a time-lapse image I found from University of Arizona, um, where they're measuring the amount of polarization throughout the day, sort of been, it's kind of interesting, you know, how different parts, you're looking at this, the building, but also the sky has different polarization patterns throughout the day because the sky is moving and the polarization information is going to, to change. As I said, I'm going to spend another five minutes about how and why mantis shrimp use this polarization information. All right, there's a lot of interesting behavioral studies on the spectral side. I'm really going to focus actually how they use uh, polarization pattern of the, of the sky in this case, right? They can still see the sky from underwater because they live in very shallow parts of the, of the water, right? So uh, my collaborator, uh, Tom Cronin from University of Maryland, he spent his whole career studying the mantis shrimp visual system. He did a really cool visual behavioral experiment, and we worked a little bit together. You know, it's interesting when you collaborate with marine biologists who are studying their visual system and you try to make up a, a behavioral experiment and you try to set up particular optical properties underwater, above water, right? We sort of used to do this in the lab. You, you have your monochromator polarization, right? You have you know, very distinct sets of elements, which we are going to use them, but now it's not a camera. It's, a, it's an animal that has to see and sort of interpret this information. So you, um, the, the part that I want you to sort of think about it is when light interacts with water, with air, a lot of things change. Intensity, color, polarization, right? So if you're trying to disambiguate, is the animal seeing polarization, but it's not making decision on intensity of color? This is a tough, tough problem. So you have to, whatever experiments we do, we actually have to make sure color and intensity are the same, only polarization changes. These experiments are, we're going to uh, show you. So these animals actually, what they do is, we have a arena, arena field of sand uh, and salt water. Um, they live in a little burrow. In the, in the initial part, we actually just put a little uh, landmark, right? It's a little landmark they can see. They live in there, uh, and then you can give them food. They like you know, uh, little fish or shells, empty shells. We stuff them with food and place them in fixed positions. So, um, and then once they actually find the food, so they do sort of a random walk, trying to find something. Once they find the food, actually, they want to go back home. For, to protect themselves, right? There could be other predators uh, that could be attacking them, right? So this is actually a really cool video looking from the top. Uh, they're coming out of the barrel. There is a little landmark here and they're making a random walk. The food is right here, right? So they have to go in, in, the, in another pole. They, they can get their food. So they're making random walks. And what's really remarkable, right? They're going to grab their food, eat it, Time to go back home. Straight line, right? And you do this number of times, right? That's sort of statistically, right? It's not just one off, right? Yes, they can miss it sometimes. That is not a perfect thing. It's not a perfect navigation, but 99% of the time, 
you know, they go straight back to their home. Now you can say, okay, there's a landmark, they can see it, right? If, if I see the Eiffel Tower and I'm walking anywhere, I know where I should be going if that's where uh, my home is, right? But here, if you actually don't have a landmark, they're sort of, you know, um, they're, they're trying to find food. They're going to, I think, uh, find their food right there. Actually, it's going to come in, right? And now they really have no idea, right? So we remove all the cues here from their, um, from the environment. There is no difference in color, polarization, intensity, no landmarks. So we show you like, Yes, in general, they have an idea, I should be going that direction somehow, but it's not a very accurate, accurate way. Now, if you're wondering, actually, if you're in robotics, you know, one of the things you can say, well, they might be doing path integrations, and they are doing path integrations, right? So this was sort of, to dispel this argument, we put the food, so while their head is in the burrow and eating their food, we're going to just move this little burrow down and see what happens. So if the path, there's path integration, which we know there is, we actually, the marine biologists know the part of their brain that can be integrated in this information. Let me see, here's the, the video, all right? So if there is a no path integration, they have a clever way they should actually go back to their burrow. So right now, they're going to jump in there. While they're eating their food, they're kind of oblivious that we're moving these things, all right? <laughs> we're trying to do this. Kind of mean, <laughs> and they, they are actually, you can sort of see it, it's a parallel line to where they were supposed to go. So they know they, there's no cues uh, here. So yes, they're kind of confused, like shooting near my home. I don't see my burrow, right? So they, they, yes, they go in uh, forever. So uh, in terms of hierarchy, right, how do they figure out where they are? If there's a landmark, they're going to go toward their landmark. Is there a difference in intensity? They use that as a cue, right? They definitely use path integration. They make a lot of random walks. Think about it, sort of the math that they have to be doing. Every time they rotate, they have to keep in track. I've rotated 10 degrees. It's a vector calculus they're doing in their, in their head, because ultimately I gotta go back home, right? And they do this many times as we see in this map. Now what's most interesting uh, to me was the fact that you can also, uh, explore this notion that they're using polarization information for navigational purposes. So the idea is that since they live in shallow waters, they can see the polarization properties of the sky. Now we've simplified the sky. We just said the sky is just zero degree polarized light. There's just one polarization properties, right? And you can make an argument, right? It's a partially cloudy day. They can see just one part of the sky. You know, they can use that information for navigational purposes, right? So while they're going to be eating their food, what we're going to do is rotate the polarization filter, right? That is just sitting on top of it, right? So you have to make sure, again, you're not changing intensity, you're not changing color. Yeah, rotating polarization filters should take care of all of that, right? You're not introducing any other optical elements. If you add other optical elements, you, you gotta be worried about these things. So, um, right, I'll just show you this last video right here. So. In this case, yes, they, they sort of figured it out. There's some food there. While they're eating, we're going to rotate the polarization filter uh, here by 90 degrees. We set them off course. Right? So nothing changed. There's nothing else in this that changed in this environment. Intensity is the same, color is the same. You're just the perceived angle of polarization that's coming down, that they're, they're seeing it we are able to rotate it. And we do this, you know, we can set them off plus or minus 90 degrees, uh, of course, for this, uh, for, this, for this work. So that was sort of what intrigued me, right? This was, I've been collaborating with this marine biologist, uh, Tom Cronin from University of Maryland, and some other ones over the last 10 years, 15 years, and slowly sort of figuring out the visual system as well as how and why they're using this visual system. That was our latest grant from the Air Force, how and when they use spectral and polarization information. So the first part that was intriguing to me is like, how can we replicate both the color or the spectral imaging and polarization imaging properties, right? So the first thing, as I said, they use this vertically stacked photo detector. Now, if you look at silicon absorption coefficient, right? We know the silicon 
has a wavelength dependent absorption coefficient, right? It's not just one, one number, right? And it actually varies by order or orders of magnitude as you go from 300 nanometer, which is 10 to the six, you know, it decreases by an order of magnitude when you get to the blue light, and then decreases a little bit less as you go further, further out. So it means if I actually put PN junctions on top of each other, I'm going to have preferentially uh, uh, preferential absorption of different of different wavelengths of different color. Right? I can use different materials. That's another way. That's another headache too, right? But here, all I have to do is just worry about doping uh, p injunctions and um, and it's actually it's an idea that goes back to the uh, I found out actually re relatively recently Kodak had IP on this idea in the late 70s or 80s. It sort of abandoned the whole idea of digital photography, vertically stacked detectors, and we know what happened to Kodak uh, after that. Uh, now, this is quantum, uh, there are actually other companies that do this. They've, it's a tough process to do, right? It's a lot of fabrication processes. We, we tried to do a single photo detectors in the lab, you know, uh, more years ago. We just figured it out, you know, there are other companies that can do this much better and we can get uh, their fabrication process. It actually turns out, even if you take a regular semiconductor process, your uh, NMOS and PMOS devices, the way they're fabricated, you already have some NP and junctions in different depths. They're not optimized for sensing. You just kind of have to take that into account or convince the factory or the, uh, the semiconductor manufacturer to change a little bit the process. What's really cool about this part is, these are the quantum efficiency measurements, is that the top photo detector is mostly sensitive to blue light, but it does see other wavelengths, right? Red, green, blue, near infrared photons, they're going to march through those, uh, through the top photo detectors, right? But the QA just, my efficiency decreases, right? Versus the deeper photo detector is mostly sensitive to longer wavelengths, it's not sensitive to shorter, shorter wavelengths. Now, um, I talked about the biology side here. The fabrication was actually something that we, we tried for a long period of time. This is something that I, you know, we worked around 2006 to 2010, where we are trying to make metallic gratings that are on the order of 70 nanometers wide, air spacing at about twice the, twice the height. And that was a little bit more difficult uh, back then. And we did a process of interference lithography where you're trying to use periodic patterns to expose your photoresist. And then you're going to pattern your photoresist and then use uh, either etching of liftoff to have aluminum wires at the very end. And we needed to have four different orientations. So you do interference lithography, you, you rotate your sample, you block out some certain areas that you don't want to. So um, it, it wasn't difficult, just a lot of optimizations you have to go, go through. Uh, we worked with some other companies and actually you can buy a lot of these polarization filters uh, off, you know, from many uh, manufacturing. Actually, Professor Brian Cunningham uses the same technology from the same company that we're using, Moxtech, to use the photonic crystals. We're actually slightly using the same pitch, just slightly different material, and that becomes a very good polarization filter. Now, one of the things that we try to do this over a number of years is how do you merge this technology, right? I can get really good CMOS cameras that have these vertically stacked detectors, but I wanna deposit polarization filters on each pixel. I really wanna have sort of where we have our color cameras, red, green, and blue, but I want to have now a pixel that's going to have zero degree, another one 45, another one 90 degree. Uh, uh, my initial approach was to do this on, actual, uh, on the actual chips. So we would get the dice chips or sometimes quarter of a wafer, do the post-processing. The problem is, is that when something goes wrong during your fabrication, you really lose a lot of wafers, right? And those, those wafers tend to be pretty, pretty expensive. Um, we actually, uh, the, the most efficient approach is to use flip chip bonding. The chip is fabricated, semiconductor chip is fabricated in the semiconductor fab. The polarization filters could be fabricated here or with the help of other companies. And then we do flip chip bonding. So we actually have this uh, alignment set up in, in the lab. And so it's basically like a mask aligner. 
but we do light alignment. So we, we shine polarized light on the polarization filter, on top of our polarization filters that we are trying to align on top of our camera. And we know very well when we're in contact, how close we are. It's a contest continuously improving this fabrication process uh, that we do, but we are getting really, we're really good right now where we have almost 100% yield. We can attach any filters to any camera and turn it into a multi-spectral polarization so camera. Specifically, what's the difference between a zero degree polarizing filter and a 45 degree polarizing filter on chip? Right, so the, the, the gradings, if you, if you see here, actually, I'll take zero and 90 degrees. Sure. So one pixel has wires that are oriented in this direction, 90 will be in the perpendicular direction, 45 will be in the 45 degrees, right? So you are, uh, you're suppressing or passing certain oscillations of your, of your light. Okay. All right, so that was a, sorry, that was the, the whole camera, as I said, that we put together, vertically stacked photo detectors. Together now we have little gradings on each pixel that gives me 0, 45, 90, 135 measurements. So now I call this a super pixel that I get both color, RGB, as well as uh, four different polarization uh, information. And these are the images that we were able to achieve. So this is the first time uh, we actually reported this in, in uh, five, five years ago. You, know, you get simultaneously color, you get simultaneously different polarization, whether it's an angle of polarization. And this is actually, uh, an interesting point is how do you present polarization information? You have to use some kind of false color uh, representation where we typically use red light to represent a zero degree, blue light to represent 90 degrees. So that's how we can sort of make sense what it is. And one of the hardest thing, you know, with this technology and as we were enabling many applications is that there's very little intuitive approach about what does polarization tell us, right? We don't see it, we have no intuition. Now I use false color to represent this information to you. So, you know, if somebody is not trained in engineering or physics, it's a very big leap to make. And one of the biggest challenges that we have is that was approaching other communities. Everybody say, well, would color give me the same information or the polarization or how do I combine these things, right? So as we go outside our comfort zone and start working with other people, you realize we take so many things for granted and it makes it very difficult for other people to adopt our technology, right? Um, so this was, as I said, we were the first one to make high resolution cameras. We went back to nature, we had many interesting grants. Uh, so this is the, actually it was really cool, i just stop it for a second. Uh, the Mantis shrimp, right, besides having this really cool visual systems, right, I'll show you how to use it for polarization uh, navigation. They also have polarization patterns on their uh, body. They have linearly polarizers on, on their, uh, they call them axillary pads, the little hands, so to speak. Um, and which is an interesting gradings, no matter how they tilt them, they get really high angle of pol uh, degree of polarization. So they almost, you know, typically we think of, you have the Brewster angle as I tilt the surface, I get different degrees of polarization. There is actually more uniform as, the, as you tilt the structure, they tend to still broadcast high degree of polarization. So there's some interesting nanostructures they also have in their, in their uh, pads. They also have quarter waves on their body, which is sex related. Uh, left and right circular polarized is used for different uh, sexes in, in, the, uh, in the mantis shrimp. You're going to see a, a cuttlefish here. So we know cuttlefish also has polarization vision. Here there's actually what you see, my video just stops working, doesn't work. We actually scare the animal and it's just, it's, it's time to run. But actually when they're more calm, there's another female fish here. They actually are able to change, not just color, in this case, they're not even changing color. They're able to change the polarization properties, right? So you see some of these animals that look, they're not doing anything, but they are actually communicating in a completely orthogonal domain, which is blind to us, right? And that's some of the analogy, right? Their predators might not see polarization, so we can have a secret covert channel of communication. Or, or, or maybe the predators do see it and they're just trying to, to disguise it, you know, they're changing it, you know, to camouflage. To camouflage it, right. I mean, th there is that too, right? It's just, right, you sort of have to see who's on top of their food chain, right? And 
Uh, yeah, the bigger predators tend to have more lousy vision, right? I mean, including us. Bigger right? mammals. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, but this was actually, it's a good segue, you know, in the last 20 minutes, I'll, I'll spend talking about the underwater polarization. And how do I stumble on this, uh, this problem? So we were actually studying the uh, cuttlefish here, right? As I say, they're really cool in changing color and polarization. It was a really cool sensor to be able to image these animals in their natural habitat, right? Now, you know, as, as an engineer, you design a camera, you bring it in your optics lab, you test it, you do quantum efficiency, you do polarization measurement, you have the whole uh, uh, suit of testing. And you know it works. You know how well it works, you, you know what are the limits, right? So we take it underwater, so the biologists were very happy that the animal was doing something else, something good, it was going with their theory, but they were, we had really strong arguments and disputes that the background polarization that we see underwater was not what they were expecting to. So what the marine biologists and the whole community was telling us that they've done a lot of measurements underwater for 20, 30 years, and what they are observing and what's been reported in the literature, right? This was uh, uh, 2001, it goes back to the 90s. Underwater light should be linearly polarized. So I should just see if it's linearly polarized, I should only see red color, the red pulse color in here. And they had their theory behind it, how light bounces, right? And, you know, but they're saying something is wrong with the camera. It's sort of, this is, I said, you cannot cherry pick your results. You're saying you like your cuttlefish polarization, but you don't like my background polarization. So, you know, it doesn't matter. The cuttlefish is everywhere in this field of view, right? We can have vignetting. We have many secondary order effects we can be disputing, right? But you always like the results you're getting, and they publish a lot of interesting work. But this was going violently against what everybody believed. And it was something actually very difficult to raise funding. Right? You have this idea, you've seen some interesting observations, and it says, well, no. Literature goes back to the 80s, tells us it's horizontally polarized. So we actually did very simple, crude way. We went back to the lab with my uh, graduate student. I don't have many equations. I really try to explain this at a, at a high level. So if you're familiar, right, you, can, you can model this using electromagnetic software, right? any wave equations. You can actually use Mueller matrices. You know, because I'm not interested in the circular polarization, which makes things a lot easier uh, of the coherence, I mean. So I can sort of do a very rudimentary, a quick way of simulating, you know, should underwater light be horizontally polarized or not? So what are the two phys physical phenomena that dictate underwater polarization, right? So the first thing is refraction, right? We know that when light gets reflected, it's horizontally polarized. The vertically polarized component actually goes in the water. Okay, so that's the refracted component. I actually can write a Mueller matrix, four by four. Those are my coefficients for the S and P polarization properties. It's great, right? It's, it's actually, you have what, uh, six parameters to, to, to model depolarization properties underwater. And then it's going to hit Let's, let's assume just single scattering phenomena is going to come here underwater, light comes in here, bounces and comes toward you, right? So depending where you're sitting, you're going to have different angle that will change your polarization properties of this scattering phenomena. So we can write another Mueller matrix, four by four matrix, really relatively sparse as matrix. And then really the hardest part was figuring out the reference systems have one reference system coming in from, it's a three-dimensional problem here. It's not a 2D simulation. Now I have to, if I'm underwater here, I have to be able to model what is the underwater polarization properties 360 de degrees around. So actually the hardest part was rotational matrices and all of that. Not difficult, but in reality, you only have five, what is it, actually four neural matrices, total of 64 coefficients which most of them are zeros anyway. So probably about 20 to 30 coefficients that dictate what's going to be underwater. If I know the salinity of the water, and that, that even doesn't matter too much, right? 
is you have air to water, that's a big index of refraction change. You can actually figure out what are the Stokes parameters. So you start with unpolarized light from the sun, go through all these millimetrices, and I can see what is my detector going to see. We call this Stokes vector. It's a four dimensional, or it's, it's one by four vector. It has four, four elements here. So the main thing I want you to think for a second is that, and we actually simulate these things, and we say, well, you know, if the sun is right above us, it's 90 degrees, the biologists were right that more or less, if I look around me, light should be horizontally polarized, right? Photon comes in here and 90 degrees scatters, right? It's a very simple problem. And you can argue why it should be horizontally polarized. But when a photon comes at a different angle in the water and then scatters, those angular differences will change the angle of polarization. So I want you to think for a second is that the angle of polarization that we see predominantly depends on the sun's elevations and the sun's heading. And I'll take it actually one step further as we were thinking harder about this problem. The only thing that actually really matters is the sun's elevation. The sun heading would just rotate this image, right? We just rotate this, this image. There's more intuition about that part. We can talk uh, offline. So indirectly, actually I have measurements about it. So we went back, we wanted to disprove this claim. This is my uh, student, Sam, Sam Powell. And so he started working on this problem. And then I have a couple of other graduate students, uh, Zhaoyang Bai and Sarah are continuing with this problem here at the University of Illinois. So by the way, as he's rotating the camera, you know, you see the angle of polarization. This is a magnetic instrument tells me where I'm heading, where is the camera pointing. And then we're just, you know, uh, having a relatively small field of view camera so I can tell you what is the angle of, of polarization here. And you see how the color changes uh, as we rotate it. Yes, cameras do time out or Windows tries to update while you're out of water. <laughs> uh, so you have to deal with all these imperfections. Once you go diving, right, at 10 meters, you can only do this so many times per day, right? It's not like, let me go back to the lab, restart these things. You can, especially we do this, um, as an auxiliary study, we're doing this a lot of times in Australia. And since, since it's such a remote place, you can only do this once a day. So collecting data, this did take us a few years to collect meaningful data. Yes? Is there any difference based on how clear the water is? If there's a lot of impurities? It is. I'll tell you that in a second, okay. right? We choose tropical waters, visibility of 20, 30 meters, really, really high quality. So the argument, of single scattering holds a little bit more there. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's that's why we also chose. We had many different rigs uh, to make these things, and I had another two students, Zhang Minju and Nico Liang, miniaturize the whole system, really improved this whole system at, over the last uh, four or five years. Uh, both of them, you know, especially Zhang Min, has been critical in making this uh, system much better, much more reliable, uh, and, and so forth. So the cool thing was, you know, this was our model, single scattering model, and these were our measurements. They coincided, right? So yes, everybody is wrong, right? This is like the, the good feeling. Um, one of the things, this is by the way, sun's elevation, 23 degrees. As it gets lower in the horizon, you also have contributions from the sky. So it's not just the sun. You have combination of sun and sky. As the sun is much higher, is so overpowering that it doesn't matter what the sky polarization is. It's, it's a fraction of uh, your, uh, your complete underwater polarization. So this is where we sort of start thinking about it, what application can we enable? <coughs> well, we said we can actually reverse the problem. We can do underwater geolocalization, right? I have a bunch of equations that are telling me from the sun, if I know the sun's position, what should be the underwater angle of polarization, right? I'm making relatively a lot of measurements, radial measurements. I can go now the inverse problem. If I have this underwater angle of polarizations, which I know predominantly depend where is the sun, I should be either solve the inverse problem. Uh, there's no unique solution, so we did a regression-based uh, approach in this case. So we have a model, and you're trying to minimize to what, the, what are your observations. We have model of what should be 
the angle of polarization in many locations around the world, and I'm trying to minimize the error by observations that I have. That was really a simple, simple uh, uh, approach. Nothing bright. And we're using a single scattering model. It's really computationally very, very efficient. And this was a really kind of uh, uh, one of the first milestones that we achieved you know, about four years ago, five years ago now, is that we did a lot of measurements in Australia, right? This was never optimized for doing underwater geolocalization. Most of the marine biologists would study their animals and would tell them, before you surface, just rotate the camera on this rig, collect the data for us, right? So it was always a side project and took us a long time. Where we had conferences, we would just take a bunch of data. So this was where, uh, I forgot which one, this must be the cross, yes, this was the true location, and this was our estimates about the, geo about the location of our uh, position. This is the mean uh, measurements of all of them. So one standard deviation, uh, two standard deviation. So we are about 2,000 kilometers off, right? Sounds a lot, but you have no idea where you are in this world. You just take a few measurements. We are within 2,000 kilometers, right? Some of them are better, but by an average, we did some error reduction stuff, but still, you know, the accuracy was, uh, wasn't the best, but it was uh, really the first step to show that if, to disprove the belief that this is not an artifact to do our sensor, right? We can take our camera, for a records correct polarization property underwater. Those underwater polarization is not horizontally polarized. Think of it, if horizontally polarized here, Australia, Central America, I can't tell you. There's no difference between these images. But these images are different. Underwater light is not horizontally polarized, point number one. Point number two is, it's diverse enough that I can tell you what is the sun's location, and I know what time and date it is that gives me the GPS location in this, in this case. Right. So this was a, uh, it's a really cool milestone. Going back to your question um, of how does light look, or what is the polarization properties when you have uh, more muddy water or low visibility water? So how can we improve the underwater geolocalization accuracy, right? When you think about it, you can say, look, I'll, I'll throw in multi-scattering problems. And uh, it becomes a very computationally difficult problem to solve because we are guessing the position. So I have to model underwater polarization properties in many places around the world, right? So that, and it's a 3D, mo 3D model too, right? So computation becomes a very difficult problem. The other part that I wanted to sort of start exploring is that these polarization properties, right? So this was uh, Champagne in, in the lake. Due to COVID, we, <laughs> we did a lot of uh, recordings in the lake behind my house. This is the underwater polarization properties. And you see how this, the angle of polarization changes slowly throughout the day, right? And you think about it, the sun is actually moving in a very well-defined arc. That arc is different here than Rantoul, than Chicago. They're slightly different between as I go, you know, uh, as a rule of thumb, for every 100 kilometers, 0 0.1 degree, in solar angle, right? So if I really try to do estimates, I need to start being able to estimate the sun's position, you know, better than 0 0.1 degree, or how do I do more measurements, right? How do I take into account that, yes, I can have a bunch of noisy measurements, but they have to be laying on a very particular arc. So this is where the temporal dynamics we started exploring, but it meant we have to go more toward the machine learning approach and train a network. And we, this is sort of the approach that we're still working on. And I'll show you some of the, some of the data that, that we have. I'll just have a couple more minutes. I know I'll go quickly through this part. So we've collected, so basically we set up our polarization cameras. Again, Jean Min was critical, making sure we have a polarization camera that's self-reliant. We have long cables, they go to the shore. And we can store this, and sorry, Bill, Bill was helping us a lot this summer, he was making a lot of cables, and it was a very tedious work. I know um, one of the projects was actually to push this camera's technology down to 100 meters, which means we have to have long cables. 
I took uh, an approach from a colleague of mine from Washington University uh, who was using webcams to do a lot of observations. So I said, well, why don't we just treat these cameras as webcams? I need them to broadcast information, store this information. So we have these cameras, some of them are still going on. We have another camera that's still collecting data in Champaign and continuously data collection from North Macedonia. We have almost a petabyte of data collected over this period of time. So now we're talking about really a lot of large data that I can start training our, our network. And, you know, is it diverse enough? You know, that's sort of the, the, the never ending, ending problem. Now, to go back to your question that you said, how does the water looks like when you're underwater? Yeah, when you're, how does the polarization property look like in muddy water or low visibility water? So this is now, we are, by the way, we're using fisheye lens. So I don't have to rotate anything. It's a fisheye lens. I get a 360 field of view. If I look at my single scattering model and what I'm measuring, they don't coincide. And it makes sense. Light, depending on the particle density, is going to make many collisions, many uh, scattering. That is going to, I, it's very difficult to, to model. If I'm in clear waters, that's very good. We actually push this concept at night. Light does not have to originate from the sun. It can be also from the moon. And that light also coming is going to reflect, scatter on the water, helps me uh, perform geolocalization, right? There's not two moons here, three. This is the moon, this is the sunlight, uh, this is the uh, security light from the dive shop that we do this, uh, uh, this measurement. So parametric model is what I told you. You're about five degrees solar accuracy, if you think about it. 2,000 kilometers. For the machine learning, we actually use a ResNet and we are evolving this approach, right? We really want to use more of the temporal aspects of this. So using a ResNet, you train a network that's going to predict your solar angles for each, uh, each image. They're going to be noisy and then we use a particle filter to turn a zero in to where this information is. So hopefully with a particle filter, we incorporate some of the temporal aspects uh, in, the, in this approach. Again, we are improving a lot of this work. So we just published this <coughs> work uh, recently. Um, and I said, we are truly really trying to use the fact that the sun moves under a very well-known trajectories. So if you, you're in Champagne, the sun doesn't go above the horizon above 28 degrees, middle of the day on December 22nd. In June 22nd, it actually goes all the way to 70 uh, degrees. So if I'm making underwater observations, this elevation angle is going to produce polarization patterns that are changing throughout the day, and I'm trying to use that information throughout the day. So using a bunch of math, using parametric model, we have five to 10 degrees uh, accuracy. When we use the deep net, we are really interested by order of, of magnitude in this case. And most importantly, right, what is our geolocalization? So, the measurements we, we did in Champagne, if you use a parametric model, it's about 2,000 kilometers, 2,000 kilometers here, 2,000 kilometers in this, give or take 100 kilometers. When we go through our uh, resonance <laughs> together with the particle filters, in the XY, sorry, in the east-west locations, we're actually better than uh, about 20 to 30 kilometers now. So we go from 22,000 kilometers down to uh, 30, 40 kilometers. It does depend throughout the day. You know, we still have a lot of room for improvement here. There are times of the day we actually are probably on the order of a couple of kilometers accuracy. Does it generalize to other parts of the day? I don't know that question. That's something we're really trying to, uh, to, to answer. And lastly, really, you know, the big thing about is uh, transfer learning. Uh, I, I didn't mention it, this part is if you train in one location, how well you can predict geolocalization in another location. Uh, so are you overlearning some of these features in, in the place, right? If I train myself uh, the network on data in Champagne and I show you images in similar water quality, such as Tampa, Florida, how are my predictions, right? Here we actually took, get a little bit uh, one step further. We trained the network at 10 meters and we went down to 50. Uh, meters in a different different locations and you can see the images look very similar at, at the same time at eight meters 
you know, this is the angle of polarization. The uh, patterns look very similar, but now you're entering other problems. It's more noisy. Um, these are relatively clear water, so we, we had a regular cameras, but we are really trying to push this down to 100 meters, even 100 plus meters. Actually, this was something we collected over the summer at 100 meters, right? These are intensity. The angle of polarization looks very, very different. Now, if I plot to you what is the angle of polarization here, actually does rese resembles to some of the images uh, that you see on the left side. But it's starting to have multiple scattering of light, and how do you account for all of that? Uh, no good answers at this point, but this is where we're trying to push this, uh, this work further. And, and last, lastly, as I mentioned, was really, this is the first time we're showing that there's polarization uh, signatures underwater, I guess it's on the sun plane, uh, during the night. So as the moon travels uh, across the sky, the underwater polarization signatures change, and I can use that information also for geolocalization. We are at 2,000 kilometers at accuracy at night. We don't have as much as data. It's more noisy, the data, right? There's a lot more problems in there, but you know, hopefully we can address some of this this, uh, this challenge as we move uh, forward. So just to conclude, right, uh, hopefully I'll convince you, you know, it's worthwhile to understand nature, right? Understand there's a lot of cool examples in nature, right? I focus on the mantis and visual uh, uh, system, but there are many other animals, butterflies, uh, you know, a lot of other animals that have really interesting uh, photonic crystals, and they use this photonic crystal in very uh, efficient ways. And efficient, I really mean in terms of information that they capture, use that information to do something clever. And I think we can learn some of those uh, lessons. We might not have the technology to replicate it, it might not make always sense. Right? We have artificial intelligence today, right? So you gotta make combination of all of these things, but you, it's, I think as engineers, it's good to look at other areas and understand how can we mimic, how can we replicate those visual systems? Uh, you know, because we've been able to really, we've been working on this mental stream visual system, making different sensors, and really we are enabling new applications. I never expected to stumble on the underwater geolocalization. It has become such a big part in, in, in my lab in this case. So acknowledgement to all the students that have worked in my lab, uh, both graduate, current PhD students, previous PhD students, uh, a lot of collaborators. You know, it takes a lot of help when we do this uh, field, field studies. All the great work is done by the students in my lab. They're really dedicated. I'm fortunate enough to, to have a wonderful group, very dedicated, uh, passionate about what I do, what they do. And thank you. talking about how the, 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 the shrimp has a multi-spectral sensor, but your the geosensing is really about polarization. So I'm wondering how does the different wavelengths play into, uh, or does it, can it, play into the geosynchronization? Yeah, I mean, I think this is where we, we need to have some estimates of the water quality or the scattering particles, right? So, you know, the fact that we're getting red, green, and blue, and we have polarization filters, is there's going to be small polarization differences in this in this wavelength, right? Can we use that further to, to refine, right? Right now, we don't have a good way, unless you tell the network, these two waters are the same, right? And we just, and that's okay, right? Well, oftentimes, you don't blindly go to the location A. You, you know location A and location B are similar waters, so I can train myself, right? Uh, but can we do something better by looking at the, some of the small differences that you see spectrally uh, difference in the, in the scattering properties of light? I think that's what we're going to see at some, some point. Yes, Nido. So um, the localization solution you propose here is, uh, is a global. Uh, localization, right? right? You right. know exactly where you are on Earth. Um, 
But from the navigation, a lot of the time, uh, people are really interested in local uh, right. localization, right? For example, for me to navigate inside this room, I don't need to know my GPS location. Right. I need to know, you know, the rooms and where I am roughly, right? right? And I guess with the shrimp, they probably would use some sort of pattern matching to get a local sense of their right. environment. So I wonder, can we learn something from the shrimp? And, and, and right. I mean, uh, you, you're right that the shrimp is not the best model for geolocalization, right? And I try to make the difference between having a compass versus having a GPS, right? Having a compass might be just perfectly fine for us to navigate in this, this room, right? Mm -hmm. And actually divers do this uh, a lot, right? They use their compass, right? And try to, uh, try to come back. However, there are other animals, uh, turtles, that we know they have polarization vision and they do travel across the Atlantic Ocean, right? So there is, animals that are using polarization potentially for GPS. Has never been established. That's a new rebrand that we're trying to pitch to the uh, Air Force uh, this year. Uh, there's evidence there is some of that. Now, of course, as an animal, you can say, well, polarization is just one of the things in my, in my pocket that I have, right? Like, there are currents, right? Like, you can tell me go this way, but if the currents are pushing me somewhere else, I better come up with a better strategy. Right? And that's what we see actually with turtles, that they use the currents, but then they can swim against the currents in a particular location, right? otherwise they can go off course. Um, now, the second point that you're making is, uh, is, is a very valid, we're focusing on geolocalization, not navigation at this, at this point. We do have data, actually, we mounted these cameras on the boats, and we traveled you know, uh, uh, longer distances. You know, Can I combine combining IME and polarization, can I do a better geolocalization? That's another, that's a future brand that we are, we are, we are trying to get preliminary uh, data. So we are, we are not there, there yet, right? So you can define this problem in many, many ways, right? And as an absolute GPS, probably less useful because you know where you are, most of the, the, the cases, right? And you use other, other cues. Can you use this for shorter uh, navigations, right? So, yeah, this is all open questions, right? And a lot of brainstorming that has to go in. Thank you. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I've noticed all the locations that you showed are by the coast. Um, have you tried this, uh, like, to see the generalized site in the middle of uh, the Atlantic or Pacific? Um, Not close to any. Yeah, lo islands. logistics is really, really right. tough. I mean, um, I would love to have a stationary camera somewhere and, and collect this data. It's probably, we, we need to go that route too, right? It just, logistics becomes a, a, a nightmare. We've been thinking about the Starlink and all of those things too, right? So yeah, we're working toward that. I, I think we're not that far off to, to have those measurements. Yes. So I'm thinking about how good engineer retarders in the sensing uh, in the eyes of the mantis shrimp are. So you showed the example where you rotated the polarization to like by 90 degrees and right. it went off course by 90 degrees. Is that true for any arbitrary angle from zero to 90? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't, you know, these behavioral studies are really tough to, yeah. to do, right? I, my other, I mean, I think a better uh, behavioral study, and we had discussions on this, is when you give a zero degree, you're really just giving one signatures, right? These eyes actually have four different polarization filters. They're looking up the sky. The sky is full of polarization patterns, right? It's not, you know, uh, uh, I showed it this one, right? You know, if you look at it, it's not just zero degrees. This is zero degree. I have 360 or 180 degrees angles of polarization. So it's a lot more richer information too. So, you know, if I rotate a little bit, right? If I rotate zero degrees by a little bit, you're just relying on one filter doing the job or you can say the other filters might be helping, right? But I think nature is a lot more richer, gives you much more richer set of information. And I think if you do the behavioral experiment, you really either have to mimic the whole sky or really alternatively rotate the aquarium 
in that case by five degrees. Are you setting it off by five degrees, right? So yeah, there's no question, but yeah, you have to think of these behavioral studies with all the optics and a lot of secondary effects that can interfere with your interpretation. You know, one of the first experiment, behavioral experiments I did you know, 10 years ago, we were looking at polarization patterns of, of sword-tailed fish. And we're trying to, we know they can see polarization, you know, we're trying to uh, do some behavioral studies, but along the way, as we were changing polarization, we're changing intensity too, right? So it's hard to disambiguate. The Are they making decisions on just polarization alone? Intensity is enough or combinations of both, right? So you gotta be really, really careful. Well, thank you everybody.